Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Your Encounter Today. Listen, tonight, every barrier to answered prayer is about to be removed in your life. We have a guest tonight who is going to really release an anointing to take you to a new dimension in prayer. But before I introduce him, I want you to introduce yourself right there in the comments. Tell us where you're watching from and what are you believing God for? What are you standing in faith for? We want to stand in faith with you. Write it down there in the comments. I try to look at every single comment, and if you've got a prayer request, you can believe that me and my team here at Encounter Today are seeing those requests, and we are praying over those needs and standing in faith with you. But listen, our guest tonight is not merely a prophetic voice. I believe that through his discipleship, particularly in regard to prayer, he is birthing a generation of of prophetic voices. He is the international best-selling author of The Courts of Heaven, and he's releasing a new book, 365 Prayers of Activation and Activations for Entering the Courts of Heaven, and he's got a fresh revelation for us tonight. Would you welcome in the comments Brother Robert Henderson to Encounter Today? Brother Henderson, it's good to have you, man. Thank you. It's so good to be with you guys. Thank you for having me. Well, we're so thrilled to have you with us. And I, I, I've been teaching on prayer myself, and we've been trying to, trying to redefine the subject of prayer. And I know you have a prophetic word for 2021, and we'll get to that before the end of this broadcast. But first, I, I've been teaching that prayer is a bridge between two worlds, that it is a portal, a point of access. And even just a few services ago, I taught on the three dimensions of prayer. And then this week, I received your book in the mail, and the first chapter chapter was the three realms of prayer. And there's this common mythology across cultures that there is another universe or a dimension. C.S. Lewis referred to a portal to that dimension as a wardrobe. Alice in Wonderland, it was a rabbit hole. In the Matrix, it's a red pill. But when you talk about the three dimensions of prayer or the three realms of prayer, is that just hyperbole or is there more to it than that? Well, no, I, I actually teach that I think some of our, our terminology, some of our awarenesses of what happens when we pray uh, need to be altered, need to need to mature maybe a little bit. For instance, uh, when we pray sometimes or when we worship and all of a sudden we sense the presence of the Lord mm. and we usually use these terms. I was praying, I was worshiping and all of a sudden God just came. Well, I have no real problem with that, honestly, but that's not of New Testament ideals. In mm. literally Jesus said that 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 he would go away in John 14. He would he would uh, be he would um, uh, go and he would begin to prepare dwelling places and all these kind of things. He would come back again, which was not talking about his second coming, but rather his coming on the day of Pentecost, and he would receive us to himself. And then he made the statement that where I am there you may be also. And so literally the Lord wants us through our prayers, our intercessions, our worship, to actually step into a dimension, a, spirit, a very real unseen yet very real dimension of the spirit, the unseen realm. And even though we're yet in the physical body, we're actually in the spirit stepping into a whole other place and arena. And of course, this is where Jesus lived. That's why he said, I only do what I see the Father do. Even though he was a, a mortal man, if you will, living in a physical body, he understood that he could live in two worlds at one time. And so when I talk about prayer, I'm actually talking about stepping into uh, these dimensions of the Spirit and in those places, recognizing where we are. And by faith, we are able to then uh, maneuver, navigate, operate in the protocols of that dimension and see things shift and move. I mean, I tell people this, prayer is not trying to convince God to do something for us. Prayer is simply stepping into a realm where God is mm. and we and him together underneath the Holy Spirit's leadership, we actually shift things in the spirit world so what is in the heavenly realm can manifest in the natural realm. Wow, this this really changes everything. And for those of you that are watching, I really feel like your prayer life is about to shift. I already sense an anointing and I believe that you're gonna rediscover a passion for prayer. Now, I believe it was Henry Drummond who said, if there's one great lack we have in the church is a lack of 
have an understanding of the science of spiritual things, that there are set laws kind of governing the spirit world, and we really treat the spirit realm with a, with a casualness we would never preach the physical realm with. When you begin to talk about the courts of heaven, you, you dive into these three realms, and specifically getting into the last one. Can you sum up those three realms for us, and then dive into this revelation on the courts of heaven? Well, you know, uh, Jesus, when, he, when Jesus taught on prayer in Luke 11 and in Luke 18, and those two places in particular, in the book of Luke, this is what I usually put it, he actually put prayer in three dimensions. Well, when his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray in Luke 11, 1, and then in Luke 11, 2, he said, when you pray, say our Father, which art in heaven. So what he did was, he said, look, Prayer is approaching God as a father. And I began to realize that when you approach God as a father, according to Matthew 6, 6, he says that, that when we pray, we should go into our room, shut the door, and the father who sees in the secret place, mm -hmm. uh, that he, he who sees in the secret place will reward us openly. So prayer, when we approach God as father, we step into a dimension of the spirit called the secret place, which is a place of great intimacy, of, the, of, of being close to the Lord. It's where God uh, shares his secrets, all these sort of things. And we began to maneuver. And the Bible says that as we're in that secret place, all of a sudden what we do in that unseen dimension of the secret realm that God then it's, it releases uh, from that place for things to manifest in the natural. He re begins to reward us openly. So that's the first round. Then as Jesus continues in Luke 11, 5 through 8, he says, and which of you having a friend? And so now he begins to talk about approaching God as a friend. Well, uh, to approach God as a friend is to step into this, into another uh, dimension of the Spirit that is called, um, it, it, it's what, uh, John, in Jeremiah 23, uh, uh, I think it's 23 verse 8, I kind of, kind of went blank there for just a minute. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 23 uh, and verse uh Eight, oh, excuse me, verse 18. It's, it's verse 18. He, he literally says, who has stood in the counsel of the Lord. So he starts talking about the counsel of God. And that's a whole other dimension of the Spirit. And Jeremiah was, was saying there that the prophets, the reason he was different from the false prophets of his day was because even though they were prophesying, they weren't prophesying out of the council or having been with God in that dimension of the spirit. And Jeremiah was saying, look, if you're a real prophet, you've been in that dimension. Of course, I mean, so much to share here, but yeah. that all that all shifted, if you will, when on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, because now that which has been only accessible to prophets, to priests, maybe to kings, some of them, it all of a sudden became accessible to all of us wow. because the Holy Spirit came and he says, look, now I'm going to, I'm going to invite you. I'm going to help you come into these realms of the Spirit and one of them is the counsel of the Lord. And then the third one, just real quickly, is in Luke 18 when Jesus continued and he began to talk about a widow coming before an unjust judge are stepping into a judicial system. And the point was not obviously that God is an unjust judge we have to convince. The point is if this widow could get a verdict from an unjust judge, how much more can we step into the judicial system of heaven before mm -hmm. God, the judge of all, if you will, into what the Bible calls the court in Daniel 7:10, the court of heaven, how much more can we step into that realm and navigate that realm in the judicial system and see decisions rendered in our behalf? And so that's the third dimension. So like I have another book that's called Father, friend and judge and it's all about moving into these realms of the spirit and knowing how to function in each one of them it's really beautifully broken down in this book and we're going to provide the link in the description it's 365 prayers and activations for entering the courts of heaven it's a daily devotion bite-sized pieces for those of you who are kind of new to this thing and i think some fresh revelation as well is in that book but this really does uncap some things because so many believers look at prayer as kind of haphazard and mysterious and our answers are accidental. It's almost like spiritual craps. We're like, come on, Jesus, daddy needs a new pair of shoes. And sometimes we <laughs> get it and sometimes, sometimes we don't. So what you're sharing with people can change everything. So what you're saying then is that the spiritual battle we're in, it is less of a battle replete with swords and shields. It is more of a courtroom battle 
and your enemy is like a prosecuting attorney trying to get you to perjure your stuff on the stand. So how, how does that translate? When we think of prayer as being a courtroom battle, what does that mean? Well, you know, for the biggest part of my life, up until 10 years ago when I began to get the understanding of this, I saw prayer as, and, and, and spiritual warfare, if you will, from a very battlefield mentality where, yes. you know, I was, I was contending, fighting against, you know, going after demon powers, and I had to, through brute force, subdue them. Uh, and I always thought, if it wasn't happening, it was because I hadn't done enough of something, hmm. you know, and I, it, it really got very wearisome, you know, over the process of time, but I kept going. That's kind of my personality and believed in perseverance. And then when I began to see that Jesus, even though there is a battlefield, I do believe that, that it's first on, it's first in the judicial setting of heaven that the, that the battle or the contend, contending issue is one. In the good scripture is Revelation 19 and verse 11, where when Jesus comes back on the white horse, it literally says he comes back to judge and to make war. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and I thought, okay, the way Jesus does battle, if you will, is he judges, which is first judicial. In other words, wow. there's judgments that are rendered and then he goes to the battlefield. And so I began to, to to see that if we would if we didn't if we didn't take what Jesus did on the cross and 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 apply it through prayer and remove the legal claims the enemy was making, then we could never beat him on the battlefield. But if we could remove those legal claims, if we could take all that Jesus had done and through repentance and through you know our activity in the spirit world, get that put into place, then the enemy's powers and rights to resist were broken and we would win easily every time on the battlefield. And I've got to say, we have seen that happen over and over and over uh, as we began in the courtroom, if you will, the judicial realm of heaven, but then moved to the battlefield. So spiritual warfare begins first in the courtroom. Those of you that are watching, I'm just, I just feel like this is a message that every believer needs going into 2021. If you haven't shared this message yet, hit that share button, hit the thumbs up button, engage with this because this is where the body of Christ needs to be. Prayer and it's, is the answer in and of itself. If we can get the church in the place of prayer. So I, I was raised uh, by a single mom. She worked in the courthouse after school. I would go to the courthouse waiting on her to finish and I would sit, this is for years, in courtrooms and watch juries uh, come in and have the case presented to them. So you're saying prayer, we have a judge, a righteous judge, our Heavenly Father. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, and we have a prosecuting attorney, Satan, who's trying to get us to perjure ourselves, trying to get a guilty verdict on our behalf. And I, and I know this because my father is an attorney. The, a good attorney will prepare uh, their uh, client for cross-examination so that they can be ex so they can excel in court and so they can get the victory what are some keys that jesus has kind of laid out for us in his word so that we can be successful in the courts of heaven well you know once you kind of get this whole idea you'll be amazed people will be amazed at um how legal the bible is yes. i mean the bible is actually a legal book i mean the old testament and new testament that's legal language in and of itself uh and so much of what is written there is written from a legal perspective and that's it just bleeds all of it bleeds into this whole judicial idea of prayer that that i believe god would bring us into one of the main things i do every day whenever i'm praying is that as i come before the lord every day um, I let it be known. I say, Lord, according to Hebrews 12, verse 24, it says, you're, it says that, um, that there is a, a blood of sprinkling that's speaking better things than that of Abel. And when you go over and you begin to look at that, you realize, wait, Abel's blood cried out in Genesis 4 when Cain killed him against Cain. Yes. And based on the testimony of that blood, God sentenced Cain. 
He sentenced him to bag up to being a vagabond and a mm. fugitive, and he sentenced him based on what the blood of Abel was saying. Well, the Bible says that we have a blood of Jesus, the, the blood of sprinkling, that is speaking better things. In other words, it's crying for God's redemption, for God's forgiveness to operate in our behalf. So what I do, for instance, is I come before the Lord every day and I say, Lord, I thank you that your blood, the blood of sprinkling, is speaking for me. And I say, I agree with that blood. Yes. I I repent for any place I need to repent in uh, because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, it says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with each other. And the blood of Jesus, it literally says, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. And so, so the so walking in the light to me means okay. I am I'm I'm not hiding anything. I'm bringing everything to, to openness and to light. So I'm confessing this. I'm acknowledging this. But now I'm asking on the basis of that that your blood would now begin to speak for me in my behalf, and that anything that the enemy would be contending for me with. And I literally say, I say, Lord, let every um, let every voice against me now be silent so that it no longer has a has a right to speak. That any voice in the spirit world from the enemy, the accuser, the adversary, anything he's saying, Lord, I remind the court that your blood is speaking for me, and I also remind the court that I am a new Testament believer, and on the basis of the new covenant that I have, your word says, my sins and my lawless deeds you'll remember no more, and you will be merciful to my unrighteousness. So anything the enemy is saying I'm guilty of, I say your blood has silenced all of that, and it can no longer speak against me. This is surprisingly evangelistic in the sense that a lot of people have become disillusioned because they prayed, at least as far as they're concerned, and they didn't see an answer. And what you're really digging into provides an answer to unanswered prayer. So how does this speak to unanswered prayers in believers' lives? Because we just kind of think, well, if God wants us to have it, he'll give it to us. What does this revelation show us? Well, see, when Jesus put, when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he said, you know, first he said, approach God as Father, because that's the basics yes. of all praying, that God is Father. But then he said, you can approach him as friend, which is stepping into a whole other dimension. But then in, in Luke 18, he said that he spoke this parable that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. And then he began to tell the story of the widow and the unjust judge. Well, see, I tell people, I said, Jesus wasn't being a cheerleader. He wasn't saying, come on, guys, you can do it. No, he was saying when he said he spoke this par- a parable that men ought always to pray and not to stop, I said the only reason people stop praying is because it doesn't seem to be working. In yes. other words, answers aren't coming. So what Jesus was saying to them, I am giving you, I am giving you guys, I am giving you the key to unanswered prayer. The things that you have, you have approached God for as father and as friend, but you haven't seen answers, I'm going to give you the key to unanswered prayer. I'm going to show you that the reason the, the reason your prayers are not being answered that are according to my will is not because God hasn't heard you or he doesn't love you or he doesn't care about you. It is because the enemy has built a case against you that is denying God the right to answer this prayer. Wow. So if you can go into the courts and remove this case that is against you, the answers will come. And that's what radically changed my life. It radically changed my life because I saw answers come to prayers that I'd been praying for for as many as three years. And then when we progressed, some prayers I've been praying for like 20 years, and all of a sudden they started coming quickly because that's what Jesus says in this parable. He literally says... He said, he said, will not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night? Yes, I say, he will avenge them speedily. He said he'll answer them speedily. And literally, we saw answers come like, like within, within, within moments in some situations. I mean, instantaneous, because when we stepped into the courts, 
uh, and brought and brought the case as as I was beginning to understand it, everything began to change and answers started coming. I'm believing that's going to happen for our audience right now as they receive this revelation, as they begin to digest this and meditate on it. You're going to get instantaneous answers to prayers you've been praying for and believing God for for years. You're about to receive a miracle. You're going to shout over for the rest of your life. You're going to get a benchmark landmark testimony as a result of this revelation. So the problem is not getting God to answer our prayers. The answer often has already been given. The issue is removing the barriers. One of the great theological problems that, that uh, prudes can have when they approach the scripture is when Daniel prayed. He prayed the will of God. God released the answer immediately, but it was 21 days. So you can pray something that is God's will. He can release the answer and you're still not walking in it. That just kind of blows the religious mind out of the water. So how do we remove hindrances, barriers to answered prayer? Well, of course, the, the, the way we do that is that, as with, as with everything, that in, in, in almost every other thing that we deal with in the spirit world, Jesus has already done it. And it is being yes. able to take what he has done and bring it into application. See, that's what I believe the Holy Spirit came for. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to take what belongs to me, he's going to bring it and reveal it to you. And so I take that to mean, among other things, that, that the Holy Spirit takes all that Jesus died for and provided for us, and he brings application to it in our life. And so when I pray, what I'm doing is I am taking what Jesus did. I'm taking his blood, I'm taking his body, I'm taking his sacrifice, and I I am I am allowing that to speak for me by my adding my faith to it, by my coming into repentance, by my uh, making the right request, by my making the right decrees or, pro or proclamations. I am coming into an agreement with everything that Jesus died for. Just real quickly, I just think about this one. I mean, so got so many, but I remember this lady called me. Her her daughter had gone for a real simple surgery. Uh, and all of a sudden, she's in the uh, ICU and in very serious condition. And I, I called her and I said, look, let me just pray. And so we were on the phone. And so I began to pray. And when I did, the Lord said to me, he said to me, he said, I want you to bring before my court. I want you to remind me of what my body and blood is saying in her behalf. And so I literally, I said, Lord, when you died on the cross, you spilt your blood. This, this girl has a covenant. And so I thank you for that which your blood is now speaking in her, ha in her behalf. But your body also purchased our healing, all the stripes you took on your back. Lord, I thank you that right now your body and blood is speaking in the courts in behalf of this girl. And I'm asking based on what, you, what your body and blood is saying, I am asking for the release of healing to come. And she she started, I mean, like immediately got well and she was she became wow. whole and restored to her family. But it was I'll never forget that because the Lord said, He said, agree with what my body and my blood is saying about her and in her behalf. And and uh, and remind me because see see in Isaiah forty three one of the best ways we can present cases in the court is to remind God of, hmm. of something like I've just said because it says Isaiah uh, forty three verse twenty six it says put me in remembrance let us contend together state your case that you may be acquitted. So wow. literally the way we state our case is by calling God into remembrance of what he has done and, and what he has said and the promises he has made and by us coming in to agreement with that. I'm, I, it's just an amazing, very simple thing, as, as almost all of God's ways are, a very simple thing and yet can bring such great results. I think it was Watchman Nee who said, no matter how powerful a judge is, he cannot rule on a case that has not been brought before him. What a is that powerful good? principle. And I think a lot of people watching have never even considered bringing their case before the courts of heaven. The book of Ephesians says we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And then Paul prays for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Could it be that what we really need, instead of the answer to our prayer that's already been provided in Christ, what we really need is a revelation in order to activate that answer? 
A absolutely. I Yes. Uh, you know, when you said that, I immediately thought about the scripture in Ephesians 3, uh, where... where um, where he says he is able to do exceedingly above yes. everything we ask or think. Well, he's able to do it, but unlocking that ability is another thing. Mm. And so when I when I read scripture like that, he says he says he is able to do above and beyond what we ask or think. So is could it be that I need revelation? I need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be in, for me to be enlightened so that I can then bring that as a case because what you just said is so very true. Uh, I, I, I try to tell people all the time that, that one of our problems is in a judge, if the court of heaven is a le legitimate judicial system, which it is, if that is true, then the judge can only render verdicts based on evidence presented. Hmm. He cannot render verdicts because let me just, I was teaching this up in Chicago. I was in a Korean group and my translator, when I got through teaching, he said to me, he said, Robert, I got to tell you a story. He said, I do translation in the Chicago court system uh, when there's a Korean person that doesn't speak English. And he said, so let me tell you what happened. He said, I was in one of those settings and this young attorney was making a case before the judge. And this young attorney went on and on and on and on. He just kept on going, and the judge was sitting there very patiently. But finally, after a long time, the judge finally looked at the young attorney, and he said to him, young man, please stop. <laughs> and, he, and then he said to him, he said, he said I, know what you're, I know what you want me to do, but you're going to have to give me a reason. Oh. And so he said, the judge wanted to give the verdict. But he couldn't because he had not been given the evidence that was necessary for that verdict to be given. You know, I share that so often, and sometimes believers look at me, like we say down in the South, like a calf staring at a new gate. <laughs> yeah. Because they have this idea, well, God knows everything. He can do it. It doesn't matter. The judge can know everything. But if he has not presented the evidence that will allow the verdict, he can't give it because if he does, it's just going to be simply turned over, overturned in the next court. It has to be based on the evidence presented. And I tell people it doesn't matter that God knows everything. He has to be presented with the evidence, and we have to know how to step into the courts and make those cases. That's actually what I've done in this new book on the 365 uh, activations, yes. is how to come before the court on a daily basis and make those cases. Well, I don't know how many, I forget how many days it takes for something to, to, to become a habit, but you don't want it to become a habit. You want it to become a lifestyle. And this 365 prayers and activations of entering into the courts of heaven, the link is in the description, is going to help you to do that. And of course, I can't help but think about a few good men, and I see Tom Cruise, and I see Jack Nicholson on the sand, and Tom Cruise is trying to break him, get him to perjure himself, get him to say something he shouldn't say, not to compare Tom Cruise to the devil, but a lot of believers are <laughs> under attack right now. In 2020, maybe they said some things they shouldn't have said. Uh, but going into 2021, as we talk about spiritual warfare, how do we silence the enemy? How do we silence the accusations, the attacks of our adversary? Well, for me, the, the, the main way that I do that is through the blood of Jesus. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11, it says, the accuser of the brethren, and that is a, that's a legal term. That's the, that's the, that accuser is the word categoris, and it means one who stands against you in an assembly. It's the idea of someone that is bringing a legal case against you. And so that's what the word accuser means. And, um, and, the, and by the way, the word, it's, it's, it is the Greek word categoris, and it's the word we get our word categorized from. Hmm. So what the devil does is through his accusations against us, he, def he puts us in boxes and defines us. Wow. And stops us from coming into the fullness of everything we were made for. He does that because his accusations actually create the uh, uh, um, a way that we think about ourselves and the way other people see us. And so I had to go into the courts and start undoing that stuff. Hmm. Well, it t verse 11 says how we do that. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their life and their death. Okay, the blood of the Lamb, basically, what it does is it silences and dismisses cases against us. Okay, the word of our testimony is not standing up in church. I mean, it, it can be, but the word of our testimony is us presenting a case. 
And I, like I tell people, I say it's one thing to silence a case against you, but it's another thing to present a case in your behalf. We need to know how to do both. And then they love not their life unto death. That's what actually gives you your authority in the Lord. See, ever, see, because mm. to the degree that we have laid our life down and chosen the will of God over our own will, to that level, we have been granted an authority, if you will, to stand before God. And so whoever, who, because like, the, for instance, the cloud of witnesses, the word witness means to give judicial testimony, but it's also the word for martyr. And so the reason they're in that position in the heavenly realm in the next life is because they chose the will of God over their own will. And they now have a tremendous place in the realms of heaven uh, uh, that can actually uh, you know, speak and, and, and give testimony in behalf of things concerning the will of God. And I have a lot of different things we could share about that. But, but anyway, when we do this, we're actually able to present cases that, that can get answered before the Lord. Before I became a minister, I worked in an international prayer center, and we prayed for people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, prayed for more than 100,000 people one-on-one. -on -one. And when I, when I began to really focus on what was hindering people in the prayer life, I saw condemnation. This is something I think you kind of alluded to as probably the greatest hindrance for people receiving prayer. Would you agree with that? And, if, and, and how do we combat that? How do we come against that? Well, what, what I try to tell people is, is Romans 8, there is, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And it actually stops there. And, it, you know, and then it, it goes on and says, to those who walk not, not in the flesh but according to the Spirit. Well, that, that's not actually there in that first verse. But so when, when he says there is therefore now no condemnation, uh, and then he goes on down and he said, who shall bring anything against the charge or bring a charge against God's elect? All these kind of things. Here's the way I deal with condemnation. Um, I say, as I said earlier, that as New Testament believers, and I've just kind of started doing this actually. I said, as a New Testament believer, the Bible says that as a New Testament believer, all my sins and lawless deeds are remembered no more, and he is merciful to my unrighteousness. So that would mean that when I come and accept Jesus as my Savior, and I'm walking before him in the light and not in darkness, that, that, that as I'm doing that, that, that there is nothing in me that the enemy can come and bring and say, okay, I have this against you. And especially for the believer, that, and, and this is what I do. Every day of my life, I come and I say, Lord, I want to thank you that your blood is speaking in my behalf. And any voice that is speaking against me, any voice of the categories of the accuser that is speaking against me, that's wanting to define me outside of what you say about me. And that's, come, that's the condemnation, the guilt, and the shame. I thank you that that voice is silenced. It's amazing when you do that, at least from my experience. It's amazing when I do that, how I feel this thing lift off of me, and all of a sudden I am able to step into a realm of faith that I couldn't because because we know we don't get anything outside the realm of faith, but it's impossible to operate in the faith realm if you're if you're cloaked with and clothed with condemnation and guilt. And so when that comes off, all of a sudden I can now believe God again. I'm always yes. reminded of First John. I think it's verse uh, chapter four, uh, where where it says that that if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart and knows all things. Yes. So, I, so in other words, I can try to play the game, but the bottom line is if, I'm, if I've got condemnation in me, God is greater than, he knows everything. But he said, but if my heart doesn't condemn me, then I have confidence with God. And so the way I come out of that condemnation and, and, uh, and free from it so that I have confidence with God is by me agreeing with what the blood is saying for me from a legal perspective in the court of heaven. This is it. This is so revolutionary. Are you guys listening? Are you enjoying this message? Make sure you like, make sure you comment, make sure you share. Tell us what you're believing God for so we can stand in faith with you. And I know, Brother Henderson, God has given you a powerful prophetic word for 2021. But before we get into that and before you break the seals on that, we want to sow into this. I want my prayer life to be revolutionized. I want our audience, the Encounter Today family, I want their prayer life to be revolutionized. Listen, those of you that are watching right now, 
You know our heart. You know our culture. We want to sow into ministries like this. Here's what I want you to do. Go to EncounterToday.com and click on the giving tab and give an obedience to the Holy Spirit. Whatever He tells you to do, if this word has been a blessing to you and help us, to be a blessing to ministries like Brother Henderson's. And I know that these barriers that have been hindering your prayer life, what's been holding back and damming up the answers to your prayers are about to be broken in response to that act of obedience. Go to EncounterToday.com. And if it's your first time giving, I'm going to send you as my gift to you just to say thank you for helping us to support ministries like this, six hours of teaching on the subject of prayer called Armed, Powerful Prayers for Perilous Times, How to Pray in the Last Days. We will send you the digital downloads because we want you equipped for these last days. So go to EncounterToday.com and get your seed in the ground. Mix your praying and your giving. Now, Brother Henderson, I got a little hint of what God was speaking to you about 2021 and all coming out of the last year, how we need clarity, yeah. how we need direction. We need a sense of purpose. What is God's word for the church going into 2021? Well, I actually heard I actually heard two words. Uh, one is the and the main one probably that people know about is is uh, that that 2021 would be a year of resurrection. Hmm. And I've done quite a bit of ministry on that on some of our live stream issues where I just began to talk about how God causes dead things to live again. And in Romans chapter four, um, I think it's like verse 18 or thereabouts, where it says that Abraham, in the presence of him whom he believed. God, and then he defines who his God was, who causes dead things to live again and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. Literally, Abraham had a God that was full of resurrection power, resurrection life, and that was still creating things, calling things that did not exist as though they did. And so that's the God we serve. And I always tell people, I said, what kind of God do you have? Because it does determine what you get. And Abraham, because he had that kind of a God, he was able to see the fullness of the promise that he had made to he and, and Sarah, and of course to bring forth the Isaac and the nation that came out of that. So and, so and so God's word was fulfilled. And so I said, that's the kind of God. God wants to bring dead things back to life. The other thing, though, that I shared, I really felt like God said, tell my people in 2021, he said, tell my people they must have a book of remembrance speaking in their behalf. And that's out of Malachi 3, verses 16 through 18, where the Bible talks about um, that if we will fear the Lord, meditate on his name, and speak often one to each other, it says that the Lord will hear and he will write a book of remembrance. And, it, and this is what he said. It said that that he would spare us as a man spares his own son who serves him. We would be like the jewels that he would make up in that day, and he would make a distinction between those who serve God and those who do not. That 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 literally we would be spared in anything that we might face or that we might go through. That God was spared because there's a book of remembrance. Now we talked about some of the things that speak in the courts. Books of remembrance are one of the things that speak in the courts in our behalf. And I said, we have to have those speaking for us and reminding God. I mean, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows all of us. But watch, there are many times where the Bible says, and God remembered Noah, and God remembered Rachel. So God remembering doesn't mean he suddenly becomes aware of you. It means he's about to move in your behalf. Wow. And books of remembrance, books of remembrance, Call him into remembrance so that, that all of a sudden he begins to, to take not a notice of you. He begins to move in your behalf because of that which is speaking for you. So I think those two words, it is a year of resurrection, what God intends to bring back to life, but it's also a year that we have the right thing speaking for us in the courts of heaven. Would you pray that over us? I feel like so many have come through the last few months and feel like some dreams have died. Some prayers yes. that they used to pray have died, and now they just feel disheartened and disillusioned, and their hope has been dashed. But I feel hope rising right now as you're ministering and as you're kind of breaking the seal on this fresh revelation for many people who are watching. Could you pray with us and let's believe God for that resurrection to take place right now? Amen. Well, Father, I just want to agree with all those who are viewing this today. Thank yes. you so much. 
Lord, for your heart, your awareness, your knowledge of who we are. But Lord, we would want to just come before you. I just pray that everyone that's listening to me, Lord, that we would just all by faith, just, just posture our hearts, come before you, Lord, by faith, step into the realms of the court of heaven that you, Lord, have graciously by your blood granted us entrance into. And as we come and stand before you, I just see this. Lord, I thank you that many are shaking free, shaking mm. off of themselves right now. Every bit of shame and condemnation and guilt yes. that the enemy would have saddled them with. For I want to say and remind them and your courts that your blood, Lord Jesus, the blood of sprinkling is speaking better things than that of Abel. That your voice, your blood is not condemning us. Your blood is releasing the voice that is allowing us to be cleansed and to be washed. That when you hung on the cross, you declared, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And I thank you that even now, that that is the voice of your blood speaking for us. And so all the shame, all the guilt, all the condemnation, Lord, your people shake free from that. And out of that, they can begin to exercise a fresh faith, a fresh heart towards you that would believe you and that would say, Lord, that, that they believe out of the loving kindness of who you are, everything that they are requesting of you, it would be heard, it would be known, and Lord, you would render verdicts in their behalf. I thank you for doing this right now in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Right now in the name of Jesus, right. I receive in the comments right now, something is breaking. Something that was dead is coming back to life again. And we're so thankful for this ministry and the gift that you are to the body of Christ. Brother Henderson, how can people connect with you? Well, there's actually one website, probably the best one, if they know my name, is roberthenderson.org. And you can get to all other places from there. There's, there's stores. There's all kinds of things. But you can, out of that website, you can go to another website called GPAC, which I lead a house of prayer, a global house of prayer, Global Prayer and Empowerment Center, GPEC, um, and it's gpec.world. You can actually go there, and there's a lot of different ways. They can just, you know, go across the website, uh, scan it, peruse it, and they can see the different areas and the different ways that they could, you know, c connect and be a part. And because I am consistently doing things that empower people on operating in the courts of heaven. Yes. I don't only write books, but I do all sorts of teachings on a weekly and a monthly basis um, uh, that, that are out there that can help people you know, get some of the fresh understanding and fresh revelation concerning these things. Well, we'll put links to all of these resources in the description as well as to Brother Henderson's social media. And the book is 365 Prayers and Activations for Entering the Courts of Heaven. Brother Henderson, we can't thank you enough for being with us today. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a great privilege. Well, we look forward to having you back. I think we're going we're gonna to pull your arm, twist your arm a little bit and have you back with us next week as well. Listen, those of you that are watching, make sure you subscribe right now to Encounter Today. Make sure you stay tuned because I'm telling you the next, the next portion, the next interview we have with Brother Henderson is going to shake some things up. But we can't thank all of you enough for joining us today. And listen, make sure you go to EncounterToday.com, get your seat in the ground, and we'll see you next time right here on your encounter today. God bless.